Take your Bibles, go ahead and hold one in front of you. Another routine. Second Peter chapter 3. <clears throat> we have come to the end of Second Peter. This has been quite a journey. I, I, I think I was definitely a, a lot thinner when I started this series. I was a lot younger, so I uh, hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, if you've not uh, checked all of these out, you can get online, of course, at uh, our webpage and all that stuff. And so I made a comment last Sunday before last. I think you got cut off some of it, but uh, uh, you've got to show up here to get the whole thing. So, can y'all hear me in the back? I don't have a I don't have a microphone. Can y'all hear me? Ron, look at me, buddy. Wake up. Uh, can you hear me back there? Yeah. What? What? <laughs> well, we come to the end, and uh, I, I've, uh, I've probably struggled over this one at last. How do you end this great, great book of, of uh, Second Peter? And I tell you, uh, when I started studying about three or four days ago, this final sermon, I, I started a couple weeks ago, but really just nailing some things down. Man, I put it aside and said, man, I just can't preach it, because I, I just struggled with really... Asking God, God, help me present this the way that you want me to present this. And I prayed, prayed, and still, just, I just, you know, I write stuff, and they're going, I don't like that. Then I write something, and I don't like that either. And so I read commentaries. I, read, I did all my research that, that, you know, I try to do. Most pastors probably try to do on this deal. And, and, uh, and, and it wasn't until late last night until I really got excited about, about what I'm about to tell you guys. I think it's a wonderful message from God this morning. But I want to begin with, with, with what Peter's going to do to us in just a few moments. And the title of the message is, okay, so what now? Okay, so 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 what? Now, so now what? So now what? Yeah. And have you ever had those experiences? I think all of our life we have these, these experiences. Okay, so now what? You know, you ever have those? I remember when I was, when I was a, a small child and, and uh, I got my, my first bicycle. I remember riding down the street. Finally, you know, learning how, you know, dad pushed me, you know, let me go, then grab my let me go, you know, kind of that problem. Y'all know the process I'm talking about. And finally, I, I finally got going. And boy, I'm pounding. So I said, Pastor, Pastor, keep pounding, keep pounding. And I'm pounding that little tiny bicycle just as fast as I can. And then finally, I realized as I'm pounding, he said, you know what? He never taught me how to stop. <laughs> and I'm thinking, so now what? You know? I remember when, when, I, when I fell in love for the first time, third grade, Los Angeles Smith, her, her uh, father was the superintendent of the school. It's pretty smart, right? And uh, I fell in love with her, Los Angeles Smith, and I gave her my Valentine, and she gave me one and, and, and uh, with some chocolate, and it had a little B on there. It said, B, my Valentine, you know. And, and, and uh, I don't know what I gave her, or maybe a, a picture of a dog and say, you're barking at the wrong tree. I don't remember what I gave her, but... <laughs> But I gave her this, and we exchanged, and we're on the playground, we give our exchange, and we're just standing there, my hands in my pocket, you know, my first love, my first Valentine, and I'll never forget just in, kind of like, so, so now what? You know what I'm saying? And so, you know, we have these moments all in our life, over and over and over again, and, and then I remember when, when uh, after I got married, I had my, my first child, you know, and you're excited, you know, and, uh, you know, you're anticipating this, and, and when that child is born, you're you're holding that child for the first time, you know, in the excitement and anticipation. You're looking at that kid, you're going, what are you saying? No. So now what? Uh, you know, I was like, yeah. And then they do something weird in the diaper. And then I'm looking at that kid, Anson, and, he's, and it's, it's, you know, the first time they, I don't want to get gross in here, but you, I mean, I don't know what I'm talking about, okay? It, it's not very nice, and so, and then this diaper's full, and I go, so what? So now what? Uh, and, and in all of our life, we have these moments of, so now what? So now what? The doctor comes in, to the, you've been to the doctor, he comes in and gives you some bad news, so now what? When, when your children all leave home and you're an empty nester, say no, so now what? And most of these, so now what moments revolve around this new information, doesn't it? Once we get this new information and this new beginning, or maybe an end to some experience that we've had, 
And all this information is given to us, and we have this information, and it changes our lives, it changes our perspective, it changes the way that we're going to handle tomorrow, it changes the way that we handle our past. It's a moment that we look at these things and say, so now what? So now what? And all of us have these experiences in this room. And some of them are great experiences, and some of those are not so great experiences. But most of them revolve around so now what moments. So we have this new information, this op opportunity, or this change in our life, and we come to the place and we say, so now what? And this is where we find Peter with us. He's been writing to us, listen to me, he's been writing to us, to, to believers, to us today. He's been talking about, in Christ, if you're truly in Christ, you have the power to live this virtuous life. And remember all the things in chapter 1 that he listed for us. He said you can live a godly life. You can live a life of godliness and, 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 a, and a life of virtue. And a life of brotherly love. And then he says, in fact, because I've empowered you with my Holy Spirit, because of what Christ has done, I'm going to give you this great ability to live a life of a godly love. Pure love in his pure sin. And he tells us all these wonderful things that we can do in our life. And then he comes to the point of, of talking about of, of, of these false teachers. You remember we talked a lot about false teachers? No? Okay. I can go back and preach that right now. Okay. But then he talks about all these false teachers. He says, in, in the church today, there are false teachers. There are those that say they are Christians and false leaders and false spiritual teachers out there that are, that are lying to you. They're twisting the gospel. They're among the church and they're outside the world today. There are those that are taking the gospel and they're twisting it and they're manipulating it to meet their own agenda and to satisfy how they can handle the Word of God and its truth and its reality and its effects and its consequences. And so they're twisting the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there's false teachers all around. And then Peter comes back and says, don't fall for that because you have the power of the Holy Spirit not to go there. So you must be very careful. You must be diligent. You must make every effort never, ever to go there. And then he reminds us in chapter 3 that we just looked at about the second coming. Because there's always consequences in God's world. You understand that? We don't like them, but that's the truth. And then he says, there will be a day of the Lord in chapter 3. And the day of the Lord will be bittersweet. It will be sweet for those who trust Christ because there will be a new heaven and a new earth and all things will be made new and you'll be in my presence. But it will be bitter because there will be destruction and there will be annihilation and there will be death and there will be hell forever and ever. So it's kind of one of those things. And so he gives us all this information. Listen to He gives us, Peter gives us all this information. Look at verse 10. Look what it says here. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and heavenly bodies will burn up and dissolve, and the earth and the works that are done in it will be totally exposed. The day of the Lord will come like a thief, and that somebody sneaks in at night. When you least expect it, when you're totally unprepared, when your defense has been loosened, and that thief is going to come in, that's going to be the day of the Lord. It's coming, church. Christ is coming. And it's like a thief at night. No one is prepared in this room, but we can only be prepared as Peter directs us. And he gives this wonderful, wonderful, how are we going to be prepared at the second coming? And so here's where, here's where we are now. Here's where we're at. And so Peter comes and he says, listen, I've given you all this information. So now what are you going to do? You know, I, I think about this often. We come to church and, and we sing and and we praise the Lord, and, and, and then the Word of God is exposed to us. And I go home, and I'm always thinking this, this question, so what are we going to do with that? What are the people that you've entrusted me to as their shepherd? How are they responding to the Word of God? I don't sleep at night because of this. I worry about this. I, I'm concerned about that. We're in a good way, like... Oh, we're really doing this. Am I, am I being as effective as I can and, and as best communicating the gospel in, in truth and in purity as best I can to you? And I don't sleep a lot because of this. I, I'm just so concerned that, that this so now what thing really gets into us and we go, 
Oh my goodness. The Word of God has been spoken on my life today and I must do something about what is said in my life today. And I come to the end of this and I'm looking all over my notes and I'm reading, reading this and I've read this about a million times, Second Peter over and over and I, and I said, Lord, did I miss something here? Because I want you to have everything that's here. Because if we have a biblical worldview, we have to respond to the Word of God. Look at the statement that I wrote here, this next bit. A biblical worldview challenges us to take what the Bible says about the future of the world seriously and to live according to that. Do you understand this? Remember what I said last Sunday? I said so often we hear about the second coming of Christ. And just like in Peter's congregation, you got to understand Peter's congregation, this is a second generation of Christians. Peter's about 70 years old. And that first generation that got saved in Acts you know, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, they're dead. And the, and the rapture didn't come. Jesus didn't come. The day of the Lord didn't come. And they're going, well, these people died. They said that Jesus was going to come, but He didn't. And they're going, maybe He'll never come. And we're living in a society 2,000 years later that we're saying, well, maybe Jesus, maybe He will come. And most of us in this room, you know that He's going to come, but we just, just live lethargically. And we just, oh, He's going to come. Whatever. And we don't take this seriously, but if we have a biblical worldview, we must consider what the Bible says about the future. And we've already looked at what the future is on the Bible. It looks pretty bad, doesn't it? The Bible we read this last week is going to burn up. That's pretty serious, isn't it? Not flood, where things are just strewn down the river, but it's going to burn. It's all gone. A little different. So the worldview, we must consider that, and we look at this. And, and so, 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 so I, I thought about this biblical worldview, and I, and I thought about how the world interprets their worldview. How many, how many of y'all read this book? Pull it up and jump. How many of y'all read the Seven Habits of the Highly Effective People? You ever read that one? Raise your hand. Go ahead and admit it. Everybody wants to be successful, right? And, and I, I, I kind of kind of thought back on that book, and, and uh, he used to have those seven principles to handle seven teaching. And what this guy did, he took he interviewed all these highly highly successful people in our culture today. He took all these successful people. He said, "I want to know what the key principle is in your life to make you successful." And I took the first three here because I think it's so interesting because. These are biblical principles. You know, God has this, this order of, of nature, of worldly order. He really does. And there's some principles that are scripturally sound that the world can take and manipulate that. Y'all understand that? No? Okay. Maybe some of y'all. And so, so, so here's what happened. You notice, let me give you just the first three. What's this now? Because Peter's been saying the same thing to us. The very first thing that this book says, be proactive. In other words, do something about it. Don't just take this information and do nothing with it. Take this information and do something with it. Do you know spiritual knowledge is not the ends to the means? Spiritual knowledge is only the tool that will activate us to act on those spiritual knowledge. You know that? It's one thing to know the Bible, but it's another thing to live the Bible. That's what I'm trying to say. So be proactive. Here's what Peter's been saying. Be diligent. Be active. Be, be involved in what the Word of God says. The second principle is this that they teach. Begin with the end in mind. I thought that was very interesting. Did you hear that? Keep focused on this end result down here. Always think about your goal and what's happening. Here's what Peter's been telling us, hasn't he? There's <laughs> going to be a day of the Lord and it's going to end. You better be thinking about that. That will change your life. If you knew right now that when we walked out the door, your life was going to end. Would you change anything right now? This means yes. Every single one of us in this room, unless you're brain dead, you know, I mean, my good, I'm going to die in a few moments here. I'm going to change some things before I spend eternity somewhere. Where are you going? So here's what Peter's been telling us. To be highly effective in the spiritual kingdom of God, you better be thinking about the end, because when I'm thinking about the end, that's going to change the way I live today. Amen? Wow. Third Put first things first. There's this famous guy in the world that said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. You know, the Apostle Paul. Did you see these principles here? And so here, check this out. Here is what, here's what Peter said to us. So now what? What are you going to do? 
If you really want to be effective in the kingdom of God, highly effective, then here's what you do. Be proactive with your life. Do something now. Don't wait till the end of your life because it's too late. It's going to be like a thief. You're not going to know. Second, remember this, that you must always keep the end in mind. There's going to be a day of the Lord, and, and God says, when that time comes, everything is burnt, is melted, is dissolved. And then finally, put first things first. See first the kingdom of God. All right, let's dive into this, okay? We're going to do verse, uh, we're going to just uh, do verse for verse and uh, kind of go through this, and uh, we'll get through this uh, pretty quickly. All right? Verse 11 really is the key verse here, all right? We'll look at verse 11 before we dive into this. Since all these things, uh, here's, what, here's what really Peter's telling us right now. Since all these things. In other words, he's been talking about the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is when, what? Things end, all right? We got that? So, so we're not going to get into all that, maloon and all that. We just don't have time to do that. So, so, so for reference purposes, we're going to talk about the day of the Lord being the time when the world ends and also for the time where, where things will we'll stop and there will be a new earth and new heaven. That's how we're going to address this right now. There's a lot of things we've talked about, but we're just going to, we're going to kind of pinpoint this thing right now. So here's what Peter's been telling. He's been told there's coming to the end of this world, the world that you know it, that's not the end result. God has another plan, but he's going to destroy this world, and he's going to have a new heaven and a new earth. And so Peter's saying right here, these things, all these things I've been telling you, all these things are going to be dissolved. This earth is going to be dissolved. It's going to be melted away. And notice, here's what he says right here. So, what now? What sort of people ought you be? The lives of holiness and godliness. So here's what Peter said. So now, what are you going to do with this? You've had all this information. I've told you the end is coming. And so now, how are you going to live your life with this knowledge that I've just told you? So now, what? That's the question I would ask you. All right? Here we go. Let me give you the, uh, uh, the four points here, and then we're going to go on. So the first thing is I'm going to say to you is uh, live expectantly different. The second thing that I'm going to tell you, I'm just going to give you that line as we go on. Live spiritually diligent. Live scripturally determined. And then finally live for Jesus. Okay? Let's go back to that first point there. Live expectantly different. Verses 11 through 13. We're going to leave those verses up here. We're just going to kind of line for line this. And let me, let me tell you about that word expectantly. One, the reason I chose this word is because the word expectantly means that you're excited about something that eventually is going to happen. You got that? Expectantly. You're excited about something that you know is going to happen. When a woman is with child, she's called, she's what? Expecting. And when you see that woman that is expecting, there's, there's a glow about them, right? Why? There's this anticipation. Think about this. There's a human body growing inside. Is that, is that crazy? Isn't that, isn't that crazy how God designed that? Expecting. And here's this. I mean, think about the whole thing. Why don't they just show up? Wouldn't that be? How many women have got like that? Just show up. I'll take that one and that, not that one. No. I'll take that one. Yeah, some of us would never got chosen, would we? Yeah. And so, but God designed it this way. That, that the woman would, would, would be expected and giving birth. Let me just say this. You know what the Bible says about that? The earth groans with labor of the coming of Jesus Christ. Why? Because the whole earth knows that Christ is coming in. And, and the whole earth is expectingly different because Christ is coming in. And it's just like that woman who's pregnant. You know, one of these days I'm going to give birth and everything's going to be different in my life. That's, that's why I'm telling you. Expectingly. Expectingly different. Look at verse 11. Look at that. Since all these things are thus be dissolved, what sort of people ought you be in the lives of holiness and godliness? That's what he's saying here. He said, you know, how do you deal with this? I mean, I've been telling you that the end is going to come, and, it's, and by the word of God, it's going to be true. You may not believe it. Others are telling you something different that it's never going to end. But I'm telling you, based on what Jesus said, based on what, what Old Testament prophets said, and also even what the apostles have said, there's going to be a day of the Lord. You can believe it and trust it. And so, I've told you all this information, so now, how are you going to handle this? 
all this stuff in this world, all these things in this world that we know it, is going to be gone. It's going to disappear. Does that change your mind at all? I mean, let's be honest here. Most of us daily think about, you know, our, our finances, our homes, you know, relationships, and, you know, and, and, you know, things that we're doing, you know, our possessions, our toys, and all this. We think we spend a lot of time doing that. I'm not down anything there. I'm just making a point. So, so, so hear me. I'm just, I mean, I don't want to listen to this because I'll be convicted. If I'm convicted, I'm going to sell something. I just, just paid it off. And, you know, I know what's going through your mind, you know. And so, so just hear me out though. So, so we spend all this energy doing this. And here's what Peter says. Let's just stop for one moment and think. All this stuff is going to just melt away. Does that change any thoughts in your mind? That's what he's saying. Does that change the way that you're going to perceive this stuff, this world, the way that you live your life? Remember what false idols and false teachers, false, idols, false teachers and false influence. They said that the world's just going to continue. It's always been that. We talked about that. And I explained what that meant. And that, that philosophical uh, mindset that's been prevalent in our society today. That, that the world just started way millions and millions of years ago. And it's just going to keep going and on and on and on and on. It's just a process. And we're part of that process. There's nothing going to change. And God heard and says, oh yeah. One of these days I will melt all this away. And I'll show you just as I did. Now here's the point. That here's what he's saying in verse 5. He said, Let me read it. Let me go back. I don't want to go back now. I think I'm going to just keep going. Here's what Peter's saying in this area. Notice in verse 12 that there, I mean, verse 11, there is holiness and godliness. That's, it ought to change us as we think about that perspective here. This holiness and godliness. Now, the thing about this is that there's some, some things that are different here. I want to talk about this. But I want to go back to the point about it all melting away. And the first one is this. There's two points. That everything that God creates has a beginning. And everything that God creates has an end. Let me say it again. Everything, God, everything that God creates has a beginning. And everything that God creates has a what? It has an end to it. All right? You know that. The universe is dying, y'all. Y'all realize that? I mean, it's really dying. They say it's expanding, but really it's separating and it's dying. The sun, for example, uh, uh, the sun, if we go outside right now, you feel the, the heat of the sun. Do you know what that is? That is four, over four million tons of mass every second that's released from the sun that gives us this heat. Do you know the sun is... That's over 4 million tons of this mass of, of, of heat that's, that's lost in the sun's element itself that's given us heat. And so, so we understand that, that the sun is, you know, it, that the more the sun goes on, obviously the more the sun comes out. Look at, look at the mirror. Have you looked at the mirror lately? Do you know that there are things that are changing in, in your face? And, you know, do you all know that? Do I need to point that out to you all and so you can look in the mirror and you know things that are created have a beginning and though the things that God has created has what? And we start deteriorating. No, we're not as young as we are. We can't jump on those ladders anymore like we thought we could and, and, and do that. And we look in the mirror and say, what's that? No, that that's a new thing there. Do you hear what I'm saying? And so it has an end. Everything God creates has a beginning and everything God creates has an end. It's winding down. You all hear this? It's winding down. There's coming an end. There's coming an end. The second thing that I noticed with this is that when we talk about this melting of this earth, we live in this nuclear holocaust. Our universe is this nuclear holocaust. The sun, let me, let me just take some things that are down here. The sun's core is 27 million degrees. That's pretty hot, isn't it? The stars that are in the heaven are these fiery balls of, of mass and, and, and things that illuminate because they're on fire. There's, so, so there's fire all around us. You know the core of, of, of our earth, the core of the earth is 27,000 degrees, 27,000 yeah, 27, degrees. And there's only a 10 mile thin crust of earth that separates us from this molten fieriness. And, Sometimes it escapes and we, we know that it erupts and things like that. But basically, there's this 10-mile thin crust here. 
not even here in San Marcos, layer that keeps this intact. Or else this whole thing would just blow up, right? So see, when, when, when Peter just didn't have a, a burrito one night, he said, man, what did I eat? You know, man, I, I think God's going to destroy the earth with fire, you know? That's just not true. How he came up with this, he came up with this with Scripture. Let me, let me give you some things when Peter says, this earth is going to go down by fire. He comes with uh, Isaiah chapter 66. Look at these scripture verses. For behold, the Lord will come in what? Fire. His chariots like the world with the wind, anger, and fury. And his rebuke will be flames of fire. For by fire will the Lord enter into judgment, and by his sword with all flesh. <laughs> and those slain by the Lord shall be many. Let's keep going to all those. Micah chapter, chapter 1 verse 4. <coughs> And the mountains will what? Melt. Melt under him. And the valleys will split open, wax before the fire, and the waters were down. A steep place. Keep going, John. Now I got four more. Behold, the day is coming. We've been talking about that, the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is coming, burning like a what? An oven. And, all, and, and, and when all the arrogance and all the evildoers and stuff. The day that is coming shall set them in place, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither the root nor branch. In other words, there's no offspring. Everyone is destroyed after generation after generation. Matthew chapter uh, 24, <coughs> verse 25. Remember what Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will remain. Here's the point. Listen, church, here's the point. This world is temporary. This is not our home if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. You didn't know that? This, this is just a temporary thing that we do this. And, and, and here's what he says here in verse 14. Can we go back to the scripture? Okay, do that. In verse 14 it says that we are to be diligent in this. We are to be diligent in this. I'm sorry, no, no, don't do that, Joe. I've got to turn on my thing. Uh, let's go back to living the lives of only this. Sorry, Joe, Joe, got bad to get back there. Put your hand in there, okay? It says here, how, how do we live our life in verse 11? How do we live our life? We live it in holiness and godliness. Well, let me tell you about holiness. Holiness is, is not just a matter of conduct. It is, it is a matter of character. Holiness gives this, this implication that it's it's yielding our lives to God that makes us holy. Remember what God says, be ye holy because what? I am holy. See, we can't be holy without Him. The Bible says that even the very best works that we do are like what? Dirty rags before Him. So there's no holiness in it. So, so this word holiness is this, this act of character, this thing that changes inside. It is something that happens within that is produced on the outside. You can't buy holiness. You can't produce holiness on your own. But it is something, this character change within you that is produced that makes you holy. And the only way that you can become holy is how? Is through Christ in you. He is our righteousness. The Bible says we are children of righteousness. Why? Because He is our righteousness. Okay? He makes us holy. So this new nature, this new mind, this new heart, this new creature in me is because Christ comes into my heart and changes everything. He makes me holy. And that's the only way I can have holy because I've had a character change. Because my character is not holy. Alright? And then it comes to this word called godliness. Godliness is, is not just the attributes there. And those are very important the way we live our life, of course. But the, the, the godliness here is just kind of a, a spiritual attitude, if you would. In other words, how do we handle God? Godliness means that how do we view God? I mean, God is this awesome God, and He deserves our respect and our honor. And above Him, there's no other gods. And that's the word where it means godliness, is that we have this, this, this really spiritual attitude toward God. And when we said we're, we, we're, we, we have godliness in, it, in us, is that we have this awesomeness, this respect, this, this, this reverent attitude toward God. So here's what Peter says. When I come on that day, when I come and, and I want to find you with a sense of holiness and godliness, look at verse 12. It says, we're waiting for and hastening the coming 
of the day of the Lord. That word waiting for is that word where I got kind of the title of this, of this first point was, it means expectantly looking. Expectantly looking. And so what it's saying is, Peter's saying, I want you to you know that the day of the Lord is coming, and when the day of the Lord comes, you want to be expecting that, that it doesn't catch you off guard. It's almost like when the woman gives birth to that child, she goes, that's a kid? Are you kidding me? No. She's been expecting it. She's been planning it. She's been anticipating it. She's had the sonogram. She's done all the evidence to show there is a human being there. And when his birth says, I knew it was going to happen. See what I'm saying? For us as believers, we must be anticipating the day the Lord is going to come. And when he comes, we say, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Mary, not that we knew it was going to happen. And so we've been expecting you, Jesus. And not caught off guard. And that's what Peter says with that. And then it says, hastening the coming of the day. That, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? How do we hasten the coming of the day of the Lord? How do we hasten, how do we speed up this process that Jesus would actually come again? You mean to tell me this verse is saying that I have a part in the coming of the Lord and, and that He might come quicker because of my response? Yeah. That's kind of new. Isn't it? That word hastening, just a couple illustrations here. You remember when the shepherds were just kind of minding their own business and they're taking care of sheep and all of a sudden these angels, these multi angels come and say, hey, guess what? The day, the first coming of Jesus is now. What you've been expecting is now. And the Bible says that when they got the good news and they were told to go to Bethlehem, the Bible says that the shepherds hastily went to see Jesus. They go, he's here. They ran as quickly as they could. You remember that little short guy called Zacchaeus? Y'all know Zacchaeus? Okay. Three of you. Zacchaeus was a little guy. The Bible says he climbed up into this yeah, some tree there so that he could see Jesus because he heard Jesus was coming to town. He's never seen Jesus. And Zacchaeus was a sorry dog. Right? And yet he wanted to see Jesus. So he climbed up the tree and he sees Jesus and Jesus looks up to him. Hey, Zacchaeus. He says, hasten yourself. Quickly come down. Because I'm going to your house today and you're going to have salvation to you and all your family. Do you think that kid said, you know what? I'll be right with you. There's some fruit up here. Don't you think? I think you, I'm going to have my wife bake you an apple pie. I'm going to do all this. And, you know, it's a man, this is a great view. Yeah, I, I worked hard to get this best seat so I could see the parade and Jesus coming to town. I'm going to wait up here a little longer. You think he did all those things? The answer is? No. Oh, that is so weak, church. No! <laughs> excited to see you. And look at the result. Salvation came to this house. Why? He hastened the day. Wow. And I'll go get that. We can speed up the coming of Jesus Christ. Let me give you three ways we can, we can pray. We can pray for the day. The scripture tells over and over. There's some scripture where it says pray for the day. Lord. Pray for the day. Lord. Pray, pray, pray. Do you think prayer changes things? Yes, it does. It sure does. Many of you are here because prayer changed your heart to the Spirit of the Lord. Prayer does change things. The second way that scripture, scripture teaches us is that we're to witness and we're to preach, doesn't it? In Matthew, uh, in Matthew uh, chapter 24, verse 14, it talks about that until the gospel is preached everywhere. And when the gospel is preached everywhere, the end will come. Jesus will come again. So you know what that tells me? I'm going to keep preaching and keep witnessing. And that's going to hasten the day of the Lord. That when everyone hears the gospel of Jesus Christ, who, by the way, maybe with the internet and all the media, can you imagine? It's happening, don't you think? No? Okay. Yeah. It, it's happening. So the day of the Lord is at hand because the gospel has been presented everywhere. That's why we have missionaries in Mexico and Africa so that the gospel come. Why? I want Jesus to come, especially before April 15th. Okay. Next. <laughs> Repentance. Acts 3, 17. Talks about times of refreshing. And when we repent, the day of the Lord will come. Let's be there. And that's really God's heart. He wants to see people repenting and coming to Christ. Give my people what you call by my name, so I'm going to say. Pray. Receive my thanks.
turn from the wicked ways, repent. Then we will hear from heaven. How many want to hear the shout of the trumpet? <laughs> you know, Jesus is coming. I want to hear that. The Bible says, and we repent. Verse 13. Look at verse 13. But according to his promise, we are waiting for what? The new heavens and the what? New the new earth. The new earth. That's kind of interesting. In which righteousness dwells. Here's Peter's point. He says, the Lord himself gave us this promise. Remember when Jesus told his disciples, I'm going to repair, I'll fix and leave you guys, but, but I'm going to repair a place for you that where I go that you may be there. What? Also, he says, I want, I want you with me. So, so, so he gives us this great promise. Now this word new is not the typical new that we find. It's uh, new, ne neos is the Greek word, which means a new in time. This, this word new is kainos, and that's, a, that's kind of an interesting word here. We find that in Revelation 21 and also here. And, and this word new is, is, is a new, different kind, unlike we've never known before. And since the world is going to burn up and dissolve, God, who created the new earth, is going to create the new earth and the new heaven. He's what Peter saying is you've got to think differently about this future. You've got to think differently. You've got to be expectantly different now because I've given you this information. When we leave this place, this is my prayer, that we'll never think of tomorrow again as the same as we thought about tomorrow. Every time we think about tomorrow, our future is always going to be Lord willing and that He's going to come. He may come right now. How would you change your life right now if you knew Jesus Christ was coming? Tomorrow. That's how we live. That's how we live. God will Verse 14. You guys still with me? Yeah. Now there's something really great at the end of this message. You know, hang with me for a while. Yes. Absolutely. And the rest of you? Yeah. <laughs> Live spiritually diligent. Look at verse 14 and check this out. Therefore, beloved. What is he saying therefore for? What's the therefore, therefore? The therefore, therefore says, listen, I've been telling you Jesus is coming again. The day of the Lord is going to be certain. You ought to change the way you think about this. So now that you're changing the way that you think about it, therefore, my beloved. In other words, those that are followers of Jesus Christ. Since you are waiting for these, in other words, you got this. Now here it comes. Be diligent to be found by him on that spot of Mr. Jesus. You remember we talked about that? Be diligent. Peter said that. Remember I brought the exercise bicycle up here? You know, remember that? I embarrassed myself by riding that thing. You know, and I rode that thing. And I said, this is what it means. Make every effort. Talk about exercise, you know, and I had a donut, and I was eating my donut. And <laughs> kind of a contradiction to being really diligent of exercise. Y'all remember that? Yeah. Okay. And so this, here's the same thing, the same scenario. It says, make every effort. Don't let anything detain you. Don't be donuts. I don't know if I, I, I made that up. Anyway, but, but don't detain yourself. Make every effort to be found ready at the coming of Christ himself. <coughs> be very diligent. You remember in Luke chapter 12 or 14, I get those backwards sometimes. In Luke chapter 12, remember the faithful servants? And Jesus looks to these servants in that, in, that, in that story that he tells. And he says, blessed are the servants who are eagerly awake and attentive to the coming of the Lord. And he's given reference to those who are blessed, who are looking, who are diligent, who are not being detained by the world. And say, well, I know you're coming, Jesus. I'm trusting you're coming. I'm going to live my life as if you're coming this moment. And notice what it says. It says, peace. It says peace, that they be found with peace. That word peace is a real close word to the Hebrew word shalom. And that word peace doesn't mean like, oh, everything's okay. That peace is this, this, this inwardness of strength. This spiritual awareness that no matter what's going around me, I have this sensibility about peace in my life. Do you know what I'm talking about? Anybody knows what I'm talking about in this room? Yeah. No matter what is happening in your life, there is something there that, you know, you ought to be panicking. Man, I am so grateful for that. I really just, I just kind of stayed here a while last night on that word. 
I began to thank the Lord for peace of mind. I just got a lot of stuff going on. And it's just a lot of things that some of y'all would just kind of leave. And some of y'all who know some of this, you come and say, man, how do you handle that? I don't know. But I did know. And he reminded me of that last time. He said, big boy, you're nothing without me. It's because of my peace that I give you that keeps your sanity in check. Right. I just have some things out there that just really make you go crazy. I really do. I'm not trying to exaggerate. But just, I'm okay. I really am. I'm not bragging on me. I'm bragging on Jesus the peace. Because he's the one that lives in me that gives me that. It's not me. And you can have that too, whatever you're going through. And notice what it says. It says, be diligent here that when I come again that you'll be found in my spiritual peace. That you just, I know where I belong. I know who I am. And I know whose I am. And then notice what he says right up there. This is kind of crazy. He says, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish. Uh-oh. Problem, right? Anybody blameless here? Anybody spotless here? So we got a problem, right? What does that really mean? Remember when it talks about that, that the bride of Christ, that when he comes again, is to be spotless and blameless and wrinkle-free? Well, let's see. They didn't even write this together, but the Holy Spirit just kind of intertwines all the scripture. That's what I mean about scripture. It just kind of does this all the time. Just, just flows all together. And that's the same, same lingo there that they use. They don't know each other. I mean, so, so here's the point that I'm trying to make. What does that really mean to be spotless and limits free? The Bible teaches it this way in 1 John 1 9. You know that scripture verse, and that's for believers too. The Bible says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from what? All righteousness. That word in the Greek that means is Isis. That word all, it means all. Isn't that a great word? All. Not all. So, so the attitude is not perfection the way that I live my life as much as it is is that I have a heart of repentance. Because I'm going to mess up. I'm going to sin. I think I might have sinned coming to church today. I'm not sure. Got a little anger and grace and he's just real slow. You know, to me very long. And then he's so innocent, you know, and he, he comes and, you know, and then remember we're getting out of church and grabs my arm. Yeah, I love you. You know, oh, I don't say that. You know what I'm saying? So we have repent. See, that's the key. It's just this hard repentance. You know why? God takes sin very seriously. He sent His Son, Christ, to die for him. So He takes very sin. We better take sin very seriously. We need to repent. And that's what it means. It doesn't mean that we just sin free. We don't have anything wrong with it. It just means we have a heart of repentance. Do you understand that? Are you with me? So I move on. Okay. That's what it says there. A heart of repentance. Whatever the next bit. Go to the next one, Joe. Live scripturally determined. Look at verses 15 through 16. Well, uh, well, that's a lot up there. You count the patience of the Lord. Remember salvation. Remember the Lord is what? Long suffering. He's got this great, that word long suffering. He's got this great reservoir, not to just unleash his anger, but he holds it back. It's amazing. He's not like us, thank goodness. Aren't you glad? Yes. But he holds back his anger. Do you think God is sick and tired of the way he's treated? Do you think so? Yes. He is. He's a holy, just God. He is so sick and tired of the way we treat him and diss him and, 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 and just the things of this earth. And yet he has this great reservoir to hold back his anger. And you better be glad. And you do not want his anger. There's judgment. We want his mercy and grace, right? And so notice what it says there. So count the patient of the Lord in salvation because he, he waits because his desires that everyone coming to a relationship with him. Just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given to him. Verse 16. As he does in all his letters, when he speaks in, in them of these matters, talking about the second coming, and what's it? There are some things in them that are just hard to understand. Anybody can identify that? <laughs> you read scripture and you go, what? 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 You have that? Anybody? Yeah. Try reading in Greek or Hebrew. What? 
It's just difficult. Some things are hard to understand. But watch this now, because this is going to be really good at the end. You stay with this. This is going to, you'll change your mind about some things. I promise you. This is good. Then he says, watch what he next says. He says, the ignorant, in other words, those false teachers. Remember the word ignorant? Ignoring truth. Remember I told you that last Sunday? Ignoring truth. Ignorant. Those that are ignoring the truth, they're ignorant. Ignorant. Ignoring the truth. Which the ignorant and the unstable, in other words, those false teachers, twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. Okay. So, they're twisting the truth, these false teachers. Verse 17. I'm going to come back to that. Verse 17. How do we respond? But you, therefore, beloved, Knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of the lawless people and lose your own stability. In other words, listen, you know the truth. You guys have heard the truth today. You're going to have to deal with it. You know that? I've given you the truth. Everyone, I don't care who you are in this room. I know most of y'all. I, I know your blood type. I know your social security number. I know where you live. I know what you do at night. You know? I know. Some of you I don't know, but guess what? The Word of God's preached, and you're, every one of us is here in this what's been saved. So if you don't like that, quit coming to church. That's why I really just be critical with it, because there's going to be more accountability on you when you come to church. But you're here today, and I'm so glad you are, because this is some good stuff. And so here you're accountable to this, and so we're accountable to this. Why? So that we're not going to get caught up in this vacuum of false teaching and all these things that sound kind of good, but we're ignoring the truth. So you, brothers and sisters, don't be ignorant, but you know the truth and you're to grow in this. Now here's what I want to say. There, there's, this, there's this teaching out there that says there's no hell. Okay? Now what's this? Some of you may believe that in this room. I'm so glad you're here today. I really am. But you just think that, maybe you think that, that everybody's just going to go to heaven. Yeah, you know, you're a good person. You're going to go to heaven. Surely God is a God of love. He's not going to send people to hell. God is God in love. and love, and, and you've heard this from this pulpit. God is love. You know we know we know love because God is love, and love, love is God, and we only can love God because He loved us first. And so there's this love triangle thing that's going on. And why would a God who loves people that created this world would would send people to hell? What kind of God is that that would do that? That destruction, that hell. And most people are buying into that. And, and there's there's even these teachers today that really are some pretty famous past gospel evangelical teachers that are now buying into this today. They go, man, I really struggle with this. and I don't understand this. And so how can the day of the Lord come and there's going to be this annihilation and when God says enough is enough and then people are going to go to hell, I can't swallow that. So I think I'm going to go the other route and they're teaching this in churches today everywhere that there's no hell. No consequences. God is love. He's not going to say anything like God would love somebody who's not going to do that. As a parent, I'm going to do that to my kids. Why is God that's better than I can do that to his kid? Then he loves me. Do y'all hear that? You, you hear that? And that's out there. And, and, and all of us struggle with this. I struggle with when I've been with somebody and they died and I knew that they, they rejected Christ. I, I was with them. And they rejected Christ. And I shared with him. I shared with him. And I saw him scream all the way into hell. I was with him that day. That bothers me. It bothers me when my friend drowned that right next to me one time. And he didn't know Jesus. That bothers me. He's in hell today. It bothers me. And I've asked God, God, I don't know about this hell thing. Man. That I just, how can a God love, dude? Being swallowed. There's some hard things. This is what Peter says. Man, Paul says these things. It's kind of hard to swallow. I don't understand them all. A lot of us in this room, there's every one of us, we've got some things that we kind of hung up on. So I thought about this, I, you know, right? So, man. And here's what's happening in the world, though. We have this society that's, that's really buying into this thing. His love and he's not even seen anybody in heaven. And it's just my love. Because we read stuff like this and it doesn't preach good. This is hard stuff that we've been dealing with. You know that. 
that. So we can't let God for good. And, and so we're talking about the day of the Lord and destruction in the world melting away. And, and, and everything that I've invested in my life is just going to just be melted. And this is hard stuff here. I got that. And so a lot of preachers say, I'm not sure I can preach on that stuff anymore because that doesn't build churches. And love and yet it's the Word of God. <coughs> so I thought about this and I thought, man. And I thought of this scripture verse. Revelation chapter 10. Don't turn there. Just listen because we're going to listen. In Revelation chapter 10, it talks about when John the Revelator is called into heaven. That's the third heaven, the presence of God. And he's up there. And all of a sudden, God says this to these angels. He says, hey, see that little tiny book over there? I want you to fly over there. I don't know if you said fly. I made that up. I, I, don't know. I want you to go there to the angels. And, and I want you to get that little tiny book. And I want you to give it to John. And I want you to feed it to him. And when he takes it in his mouth, it's going to be sweet to his tongue and bitter to his tongue. And that book, let me tell you what that book was, that little tiny book. That was the book of mystery, it's what it's called in Revelation 2. But what it really is, it took to us to understand that, it is the history book of the world. It's all revelation of what the world is going to come to. You understand that? It's all the mysteries, all the, all the truth that really is going to happen in this world. And so the angel takes that little tiny book and, and gives it to John, and sure enough, it's sweet to his tongue, but bitter to his stomach. And what that tells me is, is that the coming of the day of the Lord, the history of the world, it's sweet that we know that Jesus is going to come and he's going to set things straight and those who are in Christ Jesus are going to live eternity. We're going to rule over this. We're going to have this, this new body and this new mind and all these wonderful things and this new world and this new heaven and everything is going to be right and right forever and ever. That's just so sweet. And yet the bitterness is there's going to be destruction for those who have turned away from so see what's happening in our theological mindset today? We want to taste the goodness of the Lord, but we don't want to be accountable for His judgment that's going to come. Do y'all hear that? And so today preachers are preaching all the goodness of the Lord, prosperity. Oh, God wants to bless you. He wants to just walk with you. He wants to take all your problems and do all this. They preach the sweetness of the truth of the Word of God. Those are true. But the bitterness that makes us sick God is a righteous judge. And there's a day coming when all that we know around us and those that are not crossed will have destruction. And as he took that, he knew what the world would be. It was bitter. Sweet, it was bitter. And I resolved that to preach the truth. There's bitterness and there's sweetness. <clears throat> you don't hear that? It's just the way it is. There's going to be judgment. There's going to be destruction. And that's why, man, because of those that I've seen go straight to hell, I'll keep preaching the gospel. Last point here. Live for Jesus. Verse 18. And then we're done. This kind of last thing that he says to us. He says, just go live for Jesus, you know. <laughs> but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and to the day. For we return to grow in grace and knowledge. Grace and knowledge is just, grace and knowledge really is just a starting point in our life. It's just us. I, it's, it's, it's an indication of spiritual growth that we're to continue that. That word, that word grows in the present indicative, in which it means in Greek. It just means that it is something that we're to continue to do. It is indicative that we do that. It is a process that we keep growing and growing and maturing in His grace and is not. And here's what, here's what Peter says to us at the closing. He says, just go live for Jesus. Just go out and live for Jesus. Give Him honor and glory and recognition in your life. That's the key, church. Y'all know that? It's just that we honor Him and glorify Him. Everything that we do, we honor Him. 
Everything that we do, we bring glory to Him. All our possessions, they're just tools to bring honor and glory to Jesus Christ. Amen? This church exists just to do that one thing. It is to, 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 uh, to, to make us feel better or to make us feel comfortable or we really like Gary. It has nothing to, it has everything to do with we want to honor and glorify Him. So here's what Peter says to us. So now, what are you going to do? How are you going to live your life? How can I are you glorify God every day in our life? How can we do that? And here it is. Just simple. It's a simple prayer. God, take my life. That's the only way I can honor Him every day. God, just take my life today. Is that simple about church? After all that I've said to you, for the months that we've been in here, it comes down to the bottom line. God, I just want to honor you. Lord, take my life in your hands. Something to you, real quick. I'm not texting anybody. <laughs> Although I do have a lot of calls. Okay, here we go. What? Don't they know I'm preaching now? <laughs> Let me read to you. Listen to this, it's pretty interesting. Scientific evidence gives this, this weird thing that's happening all around us that we don't really know. If you have some of you scientists or chemists out there, you know what I'm about to tell you. But these atoms and and, and they're polarized in different ways. I'm going to read this, what this, this, this scientist says. This is so interesting in our universe. Because remember what, what Peter said. The first time that the world was destroyed, it was destroyed by what? Water. And he gave us a rainbow, which is God's promise. And the rainbow represents what? I'll never destroy the world by what? Water again. But he's going to destroy it now by why is he doing fire? Because fire is something that's all around us. And so, remember the canopy of water and the, and the, the, the oceans of, of water that was? The earth is, was water. And then in day two, he separated everything. And he took what he made of this earth and he used to destroy it. And he's going to do the same thing again, but with fire, because fire is all right. We're living in this nuclear holocaust. Notice what this scientist says about the makeup of atoms and cells all around us right now. What's this? This is pretty good. Okay, this is a Dr. Lee Chestnut in the book, Adam Speak. Consider the dilemma of the nuclear physics. When he finally looks in utter amazement at the pattern he is now drawn on oxygen nucleus. For here are eight productively, uh, I mean positively charged protons closely associated together within the confines of this tiny nucleus. And with them are eight neutrons, a total of 16 particles, eight positively charged, and eight with no charge at all. Earlier, earlier physics, early physics, whatever, early smart people had discovered <laughs> that the charges of this electricity and the magnet poles repel each other. And unlike charges, magnetic poles attract each other. In the entire history of the electrical phenomena and the electrical equipment have been built upon these principles known as the law of electrostatic force and the laws of magnetism. Now here's his point. What's this? All that say this. So, what's wrong here? What holds these nucleus? Together. Why don't they just fly apart and randomly go where they want to go? And therefore, why did they not all the atoms just begin to fly apart randomly? And scientists have said they don't understand how they're all held together. They don't understand this. I mean, chemically and scientifically, all these <coughs> atoms are just kind of just, you see microscope, they're all just doing this little thing here, you know, so what keeps them together? Let me read you a scripture for a time. Yeah, Colossians. Read this. Turn over there real quick, and I'm done. I'm wrong. This is the last minute. I'm not going to do this, but I can't. Colossians. Go, Galatians, eat, Ephesians, popcorn, Philippians. Go, yeah, turn over there. I want you to see this, really. I'm done. Colossians 1 16. So. Okay. 
you have a good friend? Who's got a good friend? Somebody read that for us, please. Colossians 1, 6 and 17. Is that there? Joe, you're so fast. Thank you. I looked in the notes. For everything was created by who? By him. By who still? Okay. For everything is created by him in heaven and in earth. Okay? The visible and the what? Invisible. Oh, anybody see the proton, the neutron? No? Okay. So everything's created on earth, heaven and earth, the visible and the invisible, where the thrones and the dominions of the rulers are upon. All things have been created through him and what? For him. Now go to verse 17, Joe. Okay, verse 17. He is before all things, and by him all things are held. What? Yeah. Okay. Some of you may have your Bible saying it's consist together. Do you have that? Some of you have that word consist. That word consist, it's, it's almost like they're stuck together, they're glued together. They're held tightly in their hand. Here's what's going to happen. The scripture just tells us that Jesus holds everything in his hand tightly. Everything consists of him. And so the answer to that scientist's question of what holds everything together, the Sunday school answer is Jesus. He holds everything together in his hands. Everything's held together, keeps it together. That 10 mile thin crust is held together, not by that 10 mile crust from that mountain that would destroy all of us. Jesus holds it all together. Most visible, things. he holds everything that makes up you and me in this physical world together. When you come to Jesus Christ, the Bible says, remember what Jesus said? Remember what the scripture said? It says, no man shall pluck anyone out of my father's hands. But one day when the day of the Lord comes, here's what happens. What's this? Jesus releases his hands and all hell breaks loose. Because he holds it together. When the Father gives him permission, he releases that. And this is what happens. And then all this fiery torment melts what we know is earth. When I thought about that, I thought about it. Oh, I want to be in this hand. How about you? Amen. I want to be in this hand. So the only way, when I told you earlier, the only way that I could live with his father's blameless, God and life before him, is that I'm in my father's hand. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can't be good enough. You can't earn it in there. It's called sonship. The right through Jesus Christ, His death, His burial, His resurrection, you and you are right to claim that only through Christ and through Christ alone. So if you're here this morning, let's I'm going to close this. I promise. If you're here this morning and you go, I don't know if I'm in that. I don't know if Christ would come today that, that I'd be in this other hand and, 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 and I would just be lost in this. It's my prayer that you trust Christ as your Lord and Savior today. Many of you believers in this room, so now what? You've been given this message today. How are you going to change the way you live? Because you know, as the scripture just tells us, we need to be diligently mindful that the day of the Lord is coming. And the way that I handle my tomorrows and my days and my moments, I have to be asking this. The makeup and my preparedness. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you can't do the same when you walk out this door today because you've heard the Word of God. When the Word of God is presented, you've got to respond to that. If you've never trusted Christ, if you've never trusted Christ, you're going to say, it's my prayer you do that today. Let me pray for you.
lamp to us, a light to us, let go. Or how can we live a life that would honor you glorify if we live in this world? You know, it's only by your grace, salvation gives us hope. Lord, I pray for believers in this room that they will be mindful of your coming sin. And they will be diligently seeking you. Change our hearts, O oh God. Help us not to be lukewarm, lethargic, so consumed with the things of this world that we miss out on your doing this world around us. If there's ever been a day Father, you know it's today that we need to rise up as children of God and to be an example of light and salt in our community. It is a mandate for us. Father, we thank you for your patience, but one day your hand opens. The things that hold together to God. Lord, I pray for anyone that's here today that does not know you, Lord, and say that today will be a day of salvation, that they will yield their life over to you. And they'll not walk out of this place, no change. Father, it's been good to be in your house today. We thank you so much for this privilege, for the opportunity to share your word, sing songs and praises. I ask you to bless each one that's here today. May the presence of the living God go before them, beside them, God, we choose to give you all the honor and glory and the praise. <coughs> and may your kingdom come. In Jesus, may we pray together. Amen. Amen. Bless you. I'd like to pray with you or minister anyone that we know of. I'll be right here. God bless you. If you're a visitor, make sure you fill out the cards.